Hi, everyone. I am Steve Kep, a co-founder of From Day One, our forum on corporate values. Welcome to today's webinar. We're excited about the topic today. We'll be looking at how employers can identify and build lasting relationships with their most capable prospective employees. But before we get started, I want to share something special we have for today's attendees. One of our monthly virtual conferences is coming up on Wednesday, May 18th. The title is New Active Approaches to Employee Coaching and Recognition. It's going to be really valuable for employers who want to engage, support, and develop talent in meaningful ways. Thanks to our partners, including today's sponsor, we have some complimentary VIP tickets available for those who've joined today's webinar, and that would be you. I'll put a link in the chat space right now. Uh, you can take advantage of this one. Um, the regular price for our conference tickets is $149, and this link will give you a free VIP ticket for the whole day's activities. Today, we'll be exploring the topic, nurturing the candidates with potential in your talent pipeline. Many prospective hires need more time to develop. So in a historically competitive marketplace, employers need to take a long view. What are the best ways to identify, guide, and build relationships with these prospects? And what kinds of structured approaches and predictive analytics will strengthen the process as well? And how, finally, can employers con convey a durable value proposition so that prospects will be mindful of it over the course of the talent life cycle? Our sponsor today is GEM. I'll tell you a little bit about them. GEM's talent engagement platform helps recruiting teams build relationships that lead to diverse, high quality talent pipelines, a great candidate experience, and predictable hiring at any scale. By working alongside recruiters' favorite tools, including email, applicant tracking systems, LinkedIn, and other social networks, GEM creates a source of truth for all intersections with talent. Using that relationship context, it can automate personalized outreach while also generating insights about the entire recruiting process. Now, before we get started, a few quick logistical items. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on demand soon after the event. So you can look out for an email in about 24 hours with the link. That email will also have info on how you can get professional development credits for this session from both the Society of Human Resource Management and the HR Certification Institute. And you can look out for a written account of the conversation on our website at fromday1.co. Around 45 minutes into the webinar, we'll have a Q&A session. You can submit your questions anytime they occur to you using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Now I'd like to introduce our moderator for today, Emily McCrary Ruiz Esparza. Emily is a freelance journalist based in Richmond, Virginia, who writes about workplace culture and policies, hiring, DEI and issues faced by women in the workplace. Her work has appeared in the Washington Post, in Fast Company and Food Technology, among other publications, and has been widely syndicated. So oh, Emily, over to you. Thank you very much, Steve, and thank you to our panelists. I'm looking forward to our conversation today. Our hour will go by very quickly, so I wanna get started. I'd like to have our panelists uh, introduce themselves Tell us your name, where you work, and what you do there very briefly. Uh, we'll begin this morning. Uh, this morning, it's the afternoon <laughs> on the East Coast where I am. <laughs> we'll begin on the West Coast with Tanya, where it is still morning. <laughs> Fair enough. I was thinking, no, it's morning where I am today. So my name is Tanya Tucker Collins, and I am the Vice President of Talent, Brand, and Experience plus inclusion, diversity, equity, and belonging for Twitch. And I've been there roughly about two years. Thanks for being here with us. Um, the sun. Hi, good, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. My name is Basant. I lead executive recruiting for Goodyear in Cleveland, Ohio. 20 years and six countries later, uh, what I bring to the table is experiences not just in contingent, but also in salary recruiting and in the current role, which is predominantly focused in hiring leaders for the organization. And I'm excited to be here. Thank you. We're glad to have you. Miriam. Hi, my name is Miriam Brilman, and I'm the East Region HR Director for Cushman & Wakefield based in New York City. Cushman & Wakefield is a leading global real estate services firm that delivers value for real estate occupiers and owners. Prior to Cushman and Wakefield, I headed a glo um, global teams of HR professionals, collaborating and enabling leadership to align organization 
and people capabilities, championing change management strategies, and driving operational and technology excellence. And what I focus on every day is providing value to the business through strategic partnership to executives on people and processes. And I'm really happy to be here, so thank you. Thanks, Miriam. Ben? Hey guys, I had some technical issues, but I'm back. Uh, I'm Ben Martin, Senior Recruiter at Zscaler, which is a leading cloud security provider for enterprise business. Based on San Jose, I am in Boston. Um, I'm fairly new here, I've been here about five months, but um, been all things recruiting, employer brand, from go to market to engineering. Thank you very much. All right, so we're here to talk about potential and potential and uh, candidates that you want to bring into your organization. So I'm going to begin with talking about how you identify uh, candidates that may not be ready to join today, but show a lot of potential for the future. So how do you identify them and how do you keep those candidates warm? Basant, what do you think about that? Yeah, so, so yeah, I'm sorry, still, you know, two years in, the mute and mute thing still gets me at times. I apologize for that. Uh, you know, when we talk about talent pipeline, uh, there is a significant focus on what we, how we define pipeline. Some, some definitions are pipelining six months down the line, and some are beyond 12 months, and sometime beyond that as well. So the tactic that we follow is that we would like to bring people across the spectrum. And again, this kind of touches a little bit about diversity of pipeline. So we'd love to bring to our pipeline people who are not there, but yet high potential. We do want to bring in a pipeline people who are already at that level and they're looking for an opportunity. But we also at times bring people who have numbers of years of experiences and they're passionate about that role, but they're not looking for that upper trajectory. So the, so the idea is you know, that you have, one has to expand the, the understanding of what that pipeline slate is and bring a comprehensive slate in front of the leader so that they can make a decision basis, uh, based on the quality, right? So, so that, that's one piece. Now, the bigger piece here is, uh, you know, Emily, I always say this, is it's a journey. Uh, you know, bringing them is an easy piece, and I'm sure a lot of participants on the call would agree with that. The challenge is to keep them motivated and engaged throughout that journey. And, and to us, where that becomes a bit more tricky is when you're trying to nurture this pool beyond nine months, right? Uh, and how do you make sure you, 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 you know, to give an example, you're trying to hire a country manager for Germany, and you, you've got people there, but you know you're going to hire them sometime in summer of 2023, uh, but you have to be able to start having those conversations. So I feel the foundation of keeping any, anyone warm is just being very communicative and setting that expectation right out of the gate, right? I mean, I would, I would not do a good job if I'm trying to talk to a candidate who is looking for a change now and slate him into that pipeline. You know, you know, for a pipeline which is that long, I need to talk to people who are very content where they are, and they would love to explore opportunity, right? So you, you get to do more coffee discussions, meet them for lunches, start some conversation with our leaders. So, so defining and matching what they're looking for and trying to align, I think I feel that's one key piece. And the second is communication. How do you create more excitement? Doing a lot of virtual things. You know, pandemic has taught us you can do virtual coffee as long as there's Grubhub or any of these services. You can, you know, grab that favorite latte or or whatever cappuccino that you like. You can create those shared experiences and and have those meaningful connections. But the key is how do you keep them warm and engaged, and how do you add? And I think the other thing I always keep saying is every time you do this keep warm conversation, how do you add to their plate? Because I feel every connection with them is a marketing opportunity. So helping them expand their understanding and giving them just enough for them to say, yes, I'm excited and I would love to know more, but let's just you know, kind of catch up after a few months. So I feel that is you know, kind of engaging and having a robust strategy there just helps to keep people connected on a longer, on a longer period. So if you're looking at people for, you know, Further, further down the road, potential hires that post nine month time frame sounds like to make that initial contact. If they're content where they are, your people are going out to contact them. You can't be expecting these people to come to you necessarily because it sounds like you're actually looking for people who 
aren't in the job market currently. Is that right? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, okay, so AI is very popular in recruiting right now. It makes it possible to source and vet a lot of candidates very quickly, which I know is really important right now as there is a worker shortage and recruiters and companies are trying to hire as quickly as possible. We tend to think as technology of technology as a way to solve a lot of problems, and we sometimes neglect ways that it might introduce problems of, their, of its own. So Ben, I'd love to know from you, because AI can contribute significantly to diversity in a, work, in a workforce by finding candidates that a human being may not have found, it can significantly hinder it too. So how can an employer ensure their applicant tracking systems and that sourcing AI actually gives candidates an equitable chance and does increase uh, diversity in your candidate pool? So I, I find this interesting. There's a couple of folks I follow on Twitter, uh, especially to make a lot of comments about AI uh, and the candidate experience and how robots are you know, going to take all of our jobs and how they are obviously biased and, and unfair. Um, I've never had the experience of using an ATS with AI. I have used some AI sourcing tools, um, but in terms of like what I've dealt with from an ATS front, it is literally resume by resume. Um, I also haven't been in a, a ton of situations where I've had a lot of inbound applicants, so I can afford to take the time to go through 20 or 30 a week, um, even if there's that many. So. I, I suppose I can't speak on the, the ATS front. Um, I think if I, you know, if I had that experience or had been in that situation, um, and the biggest thing is like, you know, they say beat the ATS. There's like a, I think there's even a Reddit thread on it. Um, but, you know, if it is based on, on keywords or buzzwords or what have you, um, I think it's kind of a two-way street, right? Like you obviously want to advertise yourself. Um, as a fit based on the requirements and the experience. And that obviously, you know, will take some editing in your resume, which hopefully your resume then aligns with the job description, which aligns with the ETS, um, and it'll flag you as a fit. Um, in terms of what I've done, if I have more of like a high volume role, um, I'll typically source within the ATS and into a Boolean search based on keywords. So obviously in that sense, like that could create some bias if those you know, strings are in someone's resume and writing. So then it's kind of working backwards and just finding, you know, finding the story, finding intangibles and taking the time to have a 20, 30 minute conversation to see like, well, like there's some question marks on paper, but I think like worth, worth investigating. And, you know, if obviously there's, there's a good case to make to a manager, like, hey, doesn't have whatever X amount of experience or hasn't used this platform, but I've done the, my, like I've done some research. The candidate walked me through it. There's similarities here. Like I think it's worth a shot. So, and then it's going back to you know core values and behavioral traits and those things. So, um, I think from a sourcing front, I've dealt more with it on that front and trying to kind of be investigative, um, and really paint a picture of someone, right? Versus just what's on paper. And then from an ATS front, I think it's you know on the candidate's end a little bit to just make sure that they're advertising themselves accurately so that they don't get flagged out for some reason. Tanya, how do you think about increasing diversity in a pipeline using technology at Twitch? So I'll speak, I'll speak in broad terms. I think the first thing in terms of when you're using technology to source or to identify talent, you should also be examining the outputs. I think you mentioned something sometimes with AI, there can be biases that have been built into that system or tool that people don't recognize and they're not seeing. Yes, you're getting hires from A, but are you getting hires from B, C, D? So the outputs are to me as cr is critical for you to examine. You can have any tool, the tool is great, but the tool is not gonna replace the recruiter. It's not gonna replace the relationship. And more importantly, it's not gonna place your ability to examine and measure the outputs of any system that you have in place. And if you are not seeing a population that is underrepresented in your org today, then I would question your AI tool. It's not giving you what you needed to be giving it. Do you, do you 
what, what do you think then is the relationship between the uh, person and the AI um, that, um, how can, how can the, the relationship there be improved? So you mentioned if, if you're not seeing it in the output, at what point does the person need to step in and say, hey, maybe we're not seeing it in the, in the broader pool that it's pulling in, like, or, or does it more happen on the other side? Is, is it more necessarily a problem of the hiring process and, and how, you're, how the person is vetting a candidate? Does that make sense? In some, I'm gonna try to put a couple of filler pieces in here to like how I would think about it or how I would approach it. Um, in terms of the output, definitely it's first, it's the diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging team should be asking some questions and should have some metrics of which they're really looking at the data of the outputs. Also, too, the real hard piece sometimes is, does the AI stop a candidate from applying? And we haven't cracked that piece. There are candidates who immediately, when they know you have AI in place, say, ah, I've done this before, it's not going to pick me. And that's where I think we have a danger. If I'm self-selecting out because I've already have a perception or I know you are a company who automatically screens for A, B, and C, and I know you're not gonna select me and they're out there, like requires a degree. So immediately the AI says, you're not, you know, you're, you can't do this. Or even I think another danger for us today is when I think of creators. So we have a lot of creators out there. And if you think about a creator, a creator has a small business, their marketing, their budgets, and they're managing small teams. Will the AI pick that unique experience up today? I doubt it. And that's the danger. And that's where we have to be careful. I think that's a good point. It's hard to say, uh, describe a really good candidate in tick boxes. In, in binary yes or no, or even pick three options. It's There's more interpretation involved with picking a really strong candidate. Even an entry level candidate who doesn't understand the magnitude of what they're producing when you get to 10,000 followers and what it took to get build your business and build your personal brand to get there. And how do you translate that to paper to put it into a system that says you're a good candidate? Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Another piece that uh, is really important to ensuring that you have a diverse talent pipeline is breaking bad habits of looking at specific pedigrees of what it takes to um, fill a role. I was actually at a coffee shop this week in which I was eavesdropping on the conversation next to me. I'm a writer. I can't help it. And the appeal this young man was making in a in a conversation with a potential employer is that both them and their fathers both went to the same legacy university. <laughs> um, and that was a good enough selling point um, in some ways for the, for the hiring manager. That was really disappointing to me. Miriam, I know you've looked at this problem of hiring the same type of person with the same background at Cushman Wakefield. What can you tell us about breaking that bad habit and how we can just really get away from that? I am so glad you asked me that question, Emily. Commercial real estate services, specifically brokerage, has a reputation for not having a diverse workforce. So you're right. Top professionals in brokerage across the board are mostly white men. And this is due in part to how the industry recruited those professionals in the past through friends or family, like you just mentioned, already in the business. So Cushman and Wakefield is keenly aware that prospective employees are being very selective about which companies are a good fit for them. We've all read all, all about that in just about every journal. No one wants to work for a company where they don't feel they belong. So to attract the best talent for our workforce, we've done a number of things that I'm really, I'm really proud of and I'm glad to talk about today. Number one, we're creating programs and brokerage to give smart, talented people a chance to learn the business by providing paid training programs where the qualifications are at where they're their fathers or mothers went to university, it's capability-based. So that, that I'm really proud about that. The second thing is we've upgraded our org structure by creating a diversity, equity, and inclusion team. We didn't, we didn't have that always. I'm not, I'm not sure every organization who's been around as long as Cushman and Wayfield over 100 years has that. So it was a big step for us to create that several years ago. And it's provided us a great platform for us to identify 
and build relationships with these prospective employees. And this team helps provide us that structure and making an impact on our workforce. The third thing we've built is strong third-party recognition as an employer of choice through a number of awards. Uh, we recently won the 2022 Best Place to Work for LGBTQ Plus Equality and Human Rights Campaign Foundation, Foundation. And we've instituted a supplier diversity strategy and advisory council, which is co-chaired by our global CFO and our new head of supplier diversity. And the fourth is, is probably pretty obvious to the panelists and most of you out there, it's getting more involved in our communities earlier in career. So as an example, we're participating in New York City Ladders for Leaders, which is a component of New York City's summer youth employment program. Brokerage, brokerage isn't the only part of our business, but it's a super important part of our business. And it's traditionally been a pay to play or a friends and family type of industry, like the guy in the coffee shop. And it's pretty clear that most of the power players in commercial real estate, specifically brokerage, have been of one type, usually you know, white men. And we've worked really hard over the past several years to make commercial real estate a viable career option for everyone. And that's really important for the business as it grows and expands and moves beyond 2022. So I really, I'm really happy you asked me this question because it's, it's near and dear to my heart. Funny enough, the, the job that this young man was interviewing for was in property management. Yes. Uh, so <laughs> it was happening in front of my eyes. Wow. Kasana, how do you think about um, uh, breaking this habit of um, looking for a specific type of background and expanding the way you think about what it means to be qualified for a role? Yeah, well, you know, in addition to what Medium just mentioned, right, I think the, the other thing to think about is we all, thanks to pandemic, thanks to all of us progressive, with progressive companies, our business landscape is changing significantly. Just the other day, we were, we were talking about the fact that in, by 2025, 75% of workforce will be millennials, right? The, the purchase power of women or diverse and minorities is going to be significant. So think about that. And then again, if I kind of reflect all of that from a Goodyear point of view, where I work for, you know, we, we still make tires, but now our tires are coming for electric vehicles and now a lot more for autonomous. And these tires are going to talk to roads, to different cars in a, in a differentiated technology. That stuff didn't exist five years back and things will emerge. Now, I would, Emily, I'll be very honest. I mean, the stuff, the people will hire, the capabilities we'll be injecting in the next five, 10 years, it hasn't existed. And if we keep doing what we do, keep going to the same places, same universities, same talent pools, we'll, we'll get the same outcomes. You have to shake it out, shake it out. And again, this has to happen across the way we build, the way we market ourselves, and, and the way we conduct our business. So, so I feel what, what Medium says resonates deeply that we all as HR professionals have to go back, look at the five-year strategic plan and say, what do we need to do to be successful and re-engineer it and say, how does how do we change our HR processes and our belief systems to make the adjustments now to be relevant for the future? Something that is newer in the recruiting world, which I'm really enjoying seeing, is more employer involvement in prepping candidates for the interview process itself. I think this is such an important move that's happening. There are companies like um, Block, formerly Square, who do this. They provide information right on their website about these are the stages of the interview, these are the type of questions that we ask, and these are the people that you'll meet. There are also third-party companies like Carrot who uh, employers can uh, uh, contract with to to effectively train candidates on how to interview or conduct technical interviews on their behalf. Tanya, what do you think about this new trend and this new way of doing interviews and what will the effect be of, um, of, of talent nurturing? So definitely it's talent nurturing and that to me is the critical piece. It's also a stepping out of those traditional pathways and that's probably why it's most critical depending upon your pathway to um, employment, how you got here. If you took a traditional path, a traditional education, most schools are gonna teach you how to interview. And therefore you're going to interview well. And if they have a relationship with that employer or an inside track, or maybe they have friends who work there, they're gonna give you what I call is the cheat codes. And, and it kind of is one of those things in tech 
around you have the cheat codes. And by having the cheat codes, you have that advantage to basically being a candidate who is most likely to get hired. That's not everybody's story. So if we start with the stories that we are really trying to broaden our perspective and bring in non-traditional candidates to our pipeline, we have to nurture that. And in nurturing that, that's probably one of the most critical things is, is that you have individuals who I could have been working somewhere for 12 years. I worked at companies where people would be there for 20 years, but they started at 16. You do the math, that person is still a viable candidate, but they only had to interview one time and they've never had to interview again. Imagine nurturing that candidate with that level of experience and exposure and everything that they bring to the table. And even more importantly, the newer ones, or again, I go back to my content creators. And that's one of the reasons why we chose to do it at Twitch. If you go to our blogs, if you go to our LinkedIn, if you go to any of those things, we are figuring out ways to nurture that candidate experience. And in addition to that, there's also the reality that some candidates, especially underrepresented, sometimes we don't know how, and I'm one of those people, we don't know how to talk ourselves up. I'm talking about the role where I am today and you're wanting me to present at that next level. And that's the gap is, is that, yeah, I can do it, but I'm presenting based upon, I checked all the boxes and, and women, we do this. So if we really wanna nurture a different experience and create something different, I think this is a critical place for us to begin to unpack that traditional pathway. I talked to a candidate, as a matter of fact, today before this call who said, I've never done STAR. And it's this moment that you go, hey, this is, this is what she does. I just found out about it last night. So we've got an opportunity to continue to still do better. Star, of course, referring to situation, task, action, result, that behavioral yeah. question, answer format. Yeah. Um, which depending on the types of positions you've had in the past, you may have never even been asked that kind of question because there are so many people changing careers right now. That may have been something they've never seen before, never encountered. Behavioral interview questions don't necessarily go with every job interview. Um, so I think that is a really good point. I think, you know, I've encountered employers who are resistant to the idea of interview training or sort of offering interview tips because they think of it like cheat codes in a negative way. Like, well, if I, I'll give away all this information, people can just game the system. But I think what people for you know, neglect to realize is that it's actually going to make the recruiter's job easier. It's going to make the hiring manager's job easier. If your, candidate, if your candidates know what you want them to show you, it's not, not an opportunity for them to cheat or manipulate. It's an opportunity for you to get through candidates a lot faster <laughs> and to get the information you want from them. And I'll add, someone is giving it to them anyway. Mm. So that's the other piece of it. If you have access and opportunity and exposure or you have a good network, then most likely someone gave you the cheat codes anyway. It was just an informal. How much more Especially powerful? In engineering, yeah. Yeah. How, how much more can we make it? Let's make it formal. And I would say too, like it's, it's about making everybody a winner, right? Like you can't hire everyone, but if you can't hire the person, you know, person A, B, C, and you hire D, at least they walk away knowing, okay, like I was set up to succeed and like unfortunate, sure, but like respectful process, awesome employer, like I'm going to go spread the word. Um, I think it's important to just, you know, send, send even the folks that we can't hire away feeling good. Yeah, it gives them more interview practice. And maybe when they come back to you in a couple of years, they're that much more prepared. So they remain in your talent pipeline. Like you said, just by having a really good first impression, um, that's, that has to do with the relationship and building a relationship with these candidates that are coming in and interviewing. Even if you're not hiring them, you may be able to say, not right now, or here's why you, we we're not able to hire you because at this point in the process, we need someone who has this capability. We just don't think you're there yet. Go work on it. Come back in a few years. So I do want to talk about building relationships and other ways that you can do that. Basant, what are other ways that you see in addition to maybe interview training? How do you start building that relationship with a candidate um, at any point that they come to you? Before I answer that, uh, I feel I have to say, look, uh, it is a candidate's market. L let's just be very clear about it, right? We, no matter whether we are a B2C or a B2B2C company, 
while I value giving outstanding service to my stakeholders, which is my, my organization, I have to be at my A game with my candidates. The moment they walk away, as, as Ben just said, uh, if they love that experience, they are going to talk about it, even if they didn't get hired, to many other people. And that is why I feel talent acquisition is such a big role to play in it. Now, the other thing I'll say is, Emily, now look, 18, 20 years back, if some of us who were doing recruiting, you know, and, you know, a big hydric executive would come and talk about, hey, I know these guys, you know, you want a GM for a country, I know these 10 people they knew they had built the connection. I think the joy, and I, I go back and again, we work like a lot of other companies on this call do work for the top five big vendors. I go to vendors if I know they are going to provide value more deeper than my recruiting team. Now, what that means is Emily, did they see the GM as a sales rep, as a director? Did they see the battle scars? Did they coach them, guide them? You know, because the, the biggest concern candidates tell us is, Applying to a company is a black hole. I mean, they don't get to hear anything. And that's the biggest. And by the way, working for an agent, sending it through a search partner is sometimes worse. They don't, it, it's such a transactional thing, right? So a lot of candidates get burned by that process. And I feel the way you should do it and you could do it is foundationally trying to do, and this is again, going back to what Tonya and Miriam were talking, less about AI, more about bringing the human connection back in it. And again, I know it's going to take a lot of time to do it. But for example, for executive roles, we try not to send uh, automated, automated rejection notes if you've declined them. We try to call them and say, hey, loved your background. Here is what we love. But here were things where we felt someone else brought more. It wasn't about saying we didn't select you. We were saying there was a better fit out there and still having a really meaningful conversation with that individual so that you walk away uh, strengthening that person's confidence because sometimes rejecting does it does hits pe person's confidence or morale or you know and and how do you make sure that you you connect it so I think that that's one piece of it but the other piece of it I feel if if you've been able to take them through the process in a very transparent fashion I feel for a recruiter and often sometimes people don't understand that I and my team can do a better job negotiating a compensation for them you know a lot of times I'll, I'll say this is a we, we don't talk about it you know, sometimes there's an offer disconnect and we go back and forth on offers is because I don't know what the candidate is thinking. I don't know what his issues are. If I know the family situation and what's going to inform the, the calm for him, I may be able to do something differently for him and be an advocate for that. You know, so I feel selfishly as for a recruiter, there's far more in stake by building that connection to be able to better represent that person and to be able to fight that battle when this candidate is not in the room and saying, no, you think this was the reason why he jumped from one to another company, but let me give you a different perspective. And I feel a stronger and a consultative recruiter can come in and add perspectives. And, and confidentially, I'll say this to you, you know, you know, I do a lot of executive recruiting, a lot of C-suite recruiting. And at sometimes at that level, when you're trying to hire a C-suite, uh, you, you're trying to hire a, you know, you know, someone who's a, a level below C uh, level, um, a lot of time people say, well, I'm not retiring, okay? And I don't need someone who in three years says, I need that job. I don't want to disappoint him. Now, there was a scenario when I was able to get someone who reported directly to a uh, CEO from a Fortune 50 company. Now, you could have rejected that candidate because saying, gosh, he's already reporting to the, to the CEO. Why would he come to a level below me? I understood the personal situation he went through because he and I had those conversations. And if I didn't know him personally, I could have never gotten the hiring manager, my CFO, had to have that conversation because those are valid questions. So I feel while there is selfishly an interest for us um, to, to kind of engage them and keep them motivated, but to fill the job and to be able to hire the right person, a recruiter, it, it's, it's a no-brainer that we have to be able to touch that relationship piece at a different level. I, and look, I understand at executive, we can do more deeply. At salary level, when you have you know 100 jobs a year, it's a different story. But I, I still feel there can be that humanness even in, in that interaction. One, Emily, if, if I may uh, jump in just for a second. So Basant, you said something about people leaving and we know people are gonna leave and sometimes people even leave for our competitors and sometimes really great people leave. But making sure that the employee leaves with a proper exit and making sure that they leave with dignity and respect is super important because 
what what Ben said before that um, the word travels, and if you disrespect respect people, you are gonna you are gonna hear it. They're gonna hear about it in the big wide world, and we're gonna be more vulnerable because people are leaving. But we also know that a lot of those people come back, and the boomerang uh, population that we have at Cushman is is quite big. And if we didn't keep those relationships, and if we didn't offboard in the proper way, we would have discouraged people from returning. So I guess. My point is, is that another candidate pool would be people who have left your company and just make sure, and my advice is to make sure that you let them leave in a dignified uh, fashion. It's, it's super important and not every company does this well. Yeah, and they'll be, you know, life, lifelong ambassadors, right? Um, and to your point, Masat, like this is obviously beyond my fair gate because I'm still a contributor, but I, I see AI as almost like a band-aid to a bigger problem, which is probably bandwidth to be able to have those connections or deeper connections versus just having to make it very transactional to keep keep pace. Um, but obviously a much bigger problem. <laughs> I want to remind our audience that at quarter till at 2.45 in about 10 minutes, we'll be taking audience questions. So if you have any for our panelists, please go ahead and put them in the Q&A function in your Zoom window. Um, Basant, you said something about uh, the uh, when you reply to a candidate with a rejection that you do your best to give them a reason why. I wonder if this is just my observation, if by doing that, you're actually forcing the company, the hiring manager, the recruiter to really think about why they're turning a candidate away, even before you go back to them. So is it really because of a qualification problem or is this a good way potentially to recognize some discrimination or some bias that exists by having to say, this is why I'm not going with this candidate and why I'm going with another one. I wonder if that's just a really good means for self-examination and trends within a, within a company. Um, Tanya, what are other ways that employers can make the interview process itself um, a talent nurturing environment beyond simply, you know, interview training? What are other ways? Other critical ways, I would say one is we have to also train our interviewers to be effective. I think you hit on something in terms of if there is bias in that interview process, how do you begin to, I always say, mitigate your bias in the interview process? That's critical. And, and we all need to be thinking about that. Um, when you're having that panel, getting like really crisp about what are we hiring for so that it's not this nebulous culture fit component. It's really about what are the skills, the capabilities, the plus ones that this person brings to the table are critical things for us to look at. And that's something we've got to do internally. In addition to that, it's also best practice. I always say, don't give all unicorns and rainbows, tell people the truth. This is the first, so that I always say the recruiter makes that initial contact and starts to basically do an informal contract it is an informal contract and we have to understand every touch point in that informal contract and ask ourselves, how are we being intentional? Because if I overpromise in the interview process, that employee is going to hold me accountable when we hire them. And I broke the contract and we have to understand that there is a informal relationship there and we have to understand it and be very crisp about it. I always say, give people a realistic job preview, tell them the good, but also tell them the things of where we have growing pains, challenges, and where the culture is not quite, but let's be crisp about the message. The other critical piece of opportunity that I think we also have is to make sure that our, our um, panels are representative of our employee population so that I'm not over gesticulating on making sure that the panel is all diverse, but there's really no diversity when you come in. And as a diverse candidate, I arrive and all of a sudden I'm going, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm the only one. You didn't tell me that. That's an uncomfortable moment for that candidate. So being clear about those things and being very intentional in the design of the interview process will help us to get better outcomes. And more importantly, will also help anybody that we hire to go, oh, I belong here. And am I showing them that they belong here and that they can make a difference and the impact that they can have? The last piece that I'll add to this is that we also have to think about in that interview process, if we do decline a candidate, what type of feedback, what type of experience are we dealing with after? Because also too, there's that reality that, hey, I've got 
one role, but I probably got 10,000 applicants. I narrowed it down to the top 300. Sometimes even just telling that person, you were the top sends a completely different message if they don't get it. It's like, I'm the top three out of the creme de la creme of the world is a completely different message than you just didn't get the job. Yeah, and what a what a ego boost too. It never feels good to be rejected from a job. You all there's always a piece of inadequacy because someone was better. But yeah, what better way to know? I was I was top ninety seven percent of the those that I was going up against, which maybe even makes me come back to the company in a year because they must like something about me. You know, it's it's a reason to apply again down the road. Exactly. Um, I want to talk about employer branding. This is uh, an emerging field and something I actually write a great deal about. Ben, I know that uh, Zscaler, you've actually started to look at some employer branding efforts. Can you talk about how uh, you've started those and what role that has that plays in your um, pipeline nurturing work? Eventually hiring our first employer brand specialist in the Americas. Um, hopefully have that offer out today. So um, Zscaler historically has had one person owning employer brand. Uh, she's amazing. This woman, Victoria Palmer, she's over in the UK. Um, but, you know, it's been a lot bigger effort in EMEA than it has in the US. And obviously nowadays with the competition level heating up, especially in security, you know, it's really a who's, who's who game. And it is very much incestuous and it's, it's networking based. Um, and so, you know, going back to the whole point of reputation and experience, um, word travels fast, especially within industry. So we not only have to provide a good candidate experience, but even to reach outside of our industry, we obviously got to have the brand and the image and the awareness to hopefully capture some eyeballs there. So um, I've done it a fairly scrappy kind of bootstrapped way. Um, CyberArk, I use my own Adobe account and just started making job tiles and um, videos, you know, profiles, on current employees, you know, doing my own pitches, um, just to like get things moving and then incorporating that with the hiring teams. So they become ambassadors and eventually just kind of spider webs into a giant network of, of social media collateral. Um, in the near term, I think with our, our first hire here, we're going to have them do mostly like regional webinars, um, probably starting in engineering first and then within sales and then we'll kind of spider web that out too. But um, and the biggest thing is, you know, obviously like we as recruiters and talent professionals and HR professionals have our own brand, right? And you want to be your own brand, an organic brand in the process, but scoping out of just the company, you know, we got to have a brand and an employee brand to, you know, oh, Zscaler, really tough interviews, but like really good experience. I learned so much two years, I went back or, you know, two years from that interview, I went to Google, whatever. Um, so they we're still letting people, you know, leave winners, whether they join us or not. Um, and for me, you know, I think it's, it's creating a brand um, within the hiring team too, right? Like you want your managers to be out there. You want the candidates to have, see that visibility in the team and understand, okay, like who would I be working with? Like, who are the people? Um, and the only way to do that is, I think is get pretty scrappy and, and go kind of hand to hand, um, have them make videos, have them make social media cards, like just get, get out there. Cause you know, everybody's on LinkedIn, everyone's sending emails, um, everybody's on Glassdoor and, and they'll see and all these other things. Um, and it's good, but like, what does that really mean? And who are you as a company outside of just these paid platforms? So for me, I think it's just, it's creating internal champions, um, you know, partnering with obviously marketing as well, or employer brand, if you have them internally and, uh, and driving it. Last question I want to pose before we go to our Q&A is a bigger picture one. So Miriam, I'd like to know uh, how you take long-term business goals, the business roadmap, if you will, and translate that into the hiring process. How are you factoring that in and how does that translation happen? Who's doing it? Okay, so you need to break the goal into key capabilities. And Tanya spoke a little bit about capabilities, but breaking the goal into key capabilities and then screening an interview for that capability is, is what you need to do. So an example could be a performance goal, say retain X percent of existing client relationships that are currently at risk or currently in RFP, 
the capabilities uh, could be, let's say, conflict management, trust and authenticity, organizational savvy, leading a cross-functional internal team. And then you go to example interview questions, which I don't know if it's, it's from the STAR model, but something like, um, give me an example of how you let and manage those who don't report to you. Have you ever had to rebuild trust with a client? Tell me about a time that you had to say no. Just standard kind of recruiting questions that would go straight to the capability that would help inform the performance goal. Um, and I forgot the second part of your question, Emily, I'm so sorry. I'm on mute. Who does the work of taking the business goals and putting it into the hiring process? So I would, I would, uh, I think ideally it would be the hiring manager, but I think a good partnership, but depending on what the position is, a good partnership between the TA professional, the talent acquisition professional, and the hiring manager is, is usually where we come up with that. And we in many companies have certain guidelines that hit, um, you know, to make sure we're not being, uh, Subjective. I, I talked a little before about how we are very keen to, to make sure that we're hiring people based on capabilities. So Tanya talked quite a bit about capability hiring. And so we want to make sure we have that meeting and not just let the hiring manager decide. They, they have a pretty good partnership, at least at Cushman with the talent acquisition people to, to break up those goals and make sure we're measure, measuring based on capability and not based on, you know, who's a Yankees fan or something. So. <laughs> <laughs> Which in some cases might get you eliminated from the process. Oh, it may. <laughs> um, Emily, okay. if you may, Emily, you know, I would also want to add a bit of it because this is something which is very, very close to my heart. Uh, how do you translate? In fact, the, the reason you exist as leader is to be able to translate the strategy, the workforce plan into tactics that recruiters understand. And the analogy I give is, look, a recruiter doesn't wake up in the morning saying, gosh, I'm going to hire that plant manager <laughs> and make life easy. The, but the recruiter would connect with the fact that, oh my goodness, I'm going to hire a plan manager which will help localize a product that helps the business in the country penetrate the market because you're having getting a high quality product from 5% to next percent. So how do you make sure you get to that simplistic view and motivate every recruiter? Now at different spectrum, whether it's a you know, contractual recruiter versus a salary or an executive, uh, the way, you know, in a, in, a, in a different setting that I worked in is uh, operating at a global level, you have to talk to global stakeholders, which means whether you're business units, so you're talking to the senior executives on what the goals for the next year is, one, going to the regions, EMEA, Asia PAC, key market, and again, top 10, top 15 markets, because big companies have markets that you cannot fail in, that's the second tier. Then going back to your teams in the country at the ground level. So essentially what you're trying to do as a leader is you're trying to get sound bites from, of strategies of key markets, key regions, and consolidating that. And again, I think you need to take an extra step as a COE leader is once you've developed that strategy based on your team and with the global intervention, go back to, again, the key folks who have a significant chunk of business and validate if you're heading in the same direction. If I can go back and relate saying by doing three things for Germany, seven things for UK um, and four for US, I, am, I can shift the needle from X to Y and I can stand in front of the CEO and the business president of the region said, this is how my team is working for you. I think I've done my job. And, and then it's that. So I feel in a more complex and I'm sure a lot of people work in those. It's the more collaborative approach of you know, having these deeper discussions. It, it typically, from a company like us, which works in Jan to December, we start that work end October uh, and wrap it up by, by early December so that we can get uh, all the sound bites on these. All right, let's go to some audience questions. I like this first one. Uh, we're looking for really practical answers. So. If you don't have a role for the candidate you interview, but you want to keep them warm, what do you actually do to nurture the candidate? Are you sending, for example, check-in emails, even though you still don't have a role? How are you actually keeping their interests? What are the, the examples of how you're doing that? Anybody can jump in on this one. I'll jump in. Um, I use either reminders, like you know, every six weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks, whatever, send them a text, email, call, just keep them, keep them engaged, keep that relationship going. Um, if it's more imminent, like I know, Hey, in two weeks, we're, you know, approving this budget, uh, and willingly, you know, if this person wants to spend time to interview, start the process kind of 
intermittently um, and that way they're engaged. We're still vetting um, all while trying to play the timing game with approvals and those things. So um, depends on the situation, but yeah, either reminding myself to say, all right, in six weeks, like send Joe a text um, or if it's the more imminent situation, hey, again, like being transparent with the candidate, we don't have a role now, but uh, you know, obviously we're excited. You sound excited. Why don't we have you meet with the team? And then we'll kind of slow roll um, a formal process. So when we get to the point of approval, they have met the team or most of the team, and it's just a matter of like one or two more conversations. Anyone else? I think these are good, good tips and examples for audience who might be looking to implement their own. Okay, we'll move on. Thank you, Ben. All right, does exploring the network of a high potential yet rejected candidate, in addition to soliciting feedback on the process, provide an effective way to nurture relationships or is that not helpful due to a sense of competition? So looking at the network of someone you've uh, turned down, is that an okay thing? Have you tried it? If you haven't, is there a reason why? Yeah, I, we have. Um, I'm sorry, go. Yeah, sorry, Ben, do you want to take a shot? Or? I'll just say, you know, it kind of in twofold, right? Like I've had plenty of candidates that I've reached out to that, you know, were too high level or too beyond comp or whatever. Um, but we had like a very meaningful connected conversation who would give me names later on. Like, oh, you know what? You know, I'm looking for a C-level role or whatever, but I know, you know, so-and-so when I worked at Cisco, for example, um, so it's either like in that immediate conversation, you can start to network or, um, you know, again, going back to the experience, right? If they had a great experience, uh, either asking directly a candidate, like, oh, you know, who else do you know? Um, or I guess casually kind of approaching it if you go on LinkedIn and see, you know, mutual connections or, or what have you. Go, go ahead, Basant, sorry. You know, in, in the business I am, Emily, I say no one is rejected. It, we may not have a role for them now, but we may have something for them in the future. So, you know, we kind of remove the connotation of rejected uh, from the discussion and then it becomes a relationship. It's the same thing you asked earlier, right? When you are talking to people and some of them you turn down because, you know, there's only so much we can offer. We do back and have a honest conversation what we can do. And by the way, they do come back with some really insightful things that we could reflect upon. So, as, as employees, you have to be humble and just listen and listen. And the more we listen, the more we can make those changes. So I feel all great, great organizations look forward to these interactions. Add just two simple things. I think it's the relationship and remembering it's about feedback. So definitely taking the candidate's feedback about the experience helps. And then also taking the input because sometimes there are times when that candidate can say, I know I'm not a fit, but I know this person is. Yeah, giving them the freedom to say that and not making it so transactional that it's a yes or no and, and nothing else. Um, thank you guys. Okay, next one. Do talent acquisition leaders coordinate with talent management leaders to develop both prospects inside and outside the company? So I guess not only talent acquisition plus talent management, are there other ways that teams or individuals can work together to develop talent inside and outside the company. We really haven't talked a lot about inside talent. Um, Miriam, I see you nodding your head. Do you have, would you weigh in on this one? Sure. Um, we, we definitely have a partnership between talent acquisition and talent management, all the high potentials. We, we you know, people who have talent management process typically have their high potentials inside the company. And we would like to internally promote, but it's good for engagement. It's good for um, the company in general, it's good for high performance culture to promote from within. So there is a very close connection between talent acquisition and talent management. So, um, so I'm not in my head saying, yes, we really tried to do that. It's, it's a really important part of, part of the process. Mm -hmm. I'm in through on this one. There should be a huge, strong relationship between both. Um, if you're hyper growth or if you have a strong existing pipeline, but you are going through either change or not, developing your internal talent is critical. People come to your company to be developed and to grow. Um, that is something that we have to recognize and the relationship between the, between the two areas, the better we can get at that, I think we can create a dynamic, holistic 
relationship, the ideal state to me is, is that, oh, there's an opening or we know we're about to expand in this area and we know we have this internal talent of individuals that we can easily begin to have them shift if they want to go there. And then at the same time, that still gives us opportunity to bring talent in. So it just becomes a real holistic cycle. And we have a lot of opportunity, I think, across TA and TM to do that. Yes. And I just to add on to that, Emily and Tanya, I think um, it's really important that the talent acquisition teams have specific measurements to help reward that behavior. Because sometimes I find, in, especially in the bigger companies, talent acquisition people are rewarded by time to fill and other metrics that don't um, that don't that don't support the model of talent management and talent acquisition be, uh, being together because that's the way to get your high performance culture. It's not time to fill necessarily. I mean, that's important too, but some of the metrics I think we use for talent acquisition are really uh, pretty outdated. That's the first thing. The second thing is I find that a lot of our talent acquisition people are really overworked right now because of what's going on with the um, with the with the population and the great resignation and and all of that, it's 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 really hard for for them to be thoughtful and to take the time to do that, especially if they're measured on metrics that that don't necessarily add to the culture. So a little shout out for people who have some influence there in terms of metrics for the TA folks. On a related note, we have a question: Any suggestions on a good succession management tool? anybody? Gosh, you know, we're trying, I mean, all of us are trying to get that integrated tool. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, look, I, I, I go back saying I'm agnostic as long as it has the foundation. I, to me, it is what is more important is, is the HR, the human capital system integrated? Um, because I think at the end of it, if, if we can connect right from all the whole, you know, uh, creating a requisition to, you know, uh, to the exit and in one system in an intelligent way that allows us to do data mining effectively, that to me is gold standard because having isolated systems worked up to a certain level, but the moment they start talking advanced analytics because of different platforms, they don't talk. Uh, and, and there are a bunch of some really big ones out there that all of us are aware of. So I'm not going to vote one or the other, but but talk more of the holistic strategy, which is what a lot of companies have realized in the last seven, eight years. A lot of big ones have started investing in that foundational tech to replace everything else that we've had. I can honestly say I've worked for a lot of companies I have yet to see fun that hasn't replaced either a team or a data analytics function helping to come in and help to be able to pull different levels of data because the real thing is you could say, oh, it's the tool that manages succession. It's also, you have to know what type of company culture you're in. What, it, what does succession mean for your company culture? Like I'm thinking of where I'm at today, hyper growth and we're adding a third to our population. Is it really succession? Or is it something different versus another company that's got a long history and legacy that really is doing succession planning at a deeper level? That's a good point. Well, I'm sorry we weren't able to get to everybody's questions. There were a lot of really good ones, but I really appreciate the panelists fielding those. Uh, we are just out of time. It's 2.59. So I want to thank all of our panelists again, Miriam, Tanya, Bassan, and Ben, and for all of our audience uh, for being here. I'm going to kick it back to Steve for some closing information. Thank you, Emily, and all of our speakers for a really thoughtful and dynamic conversation with lots of practical tips for our audience and even some business ideas there for our new tools that entrepreneurs could create for you. So thanks again to our sponsor, Gem, and to all of you who participated today. If you'd like to join us for more virtual events, you can head to our website at fromday1.co and check out more of our upcoming webinars. I'll mention some uh, events coming up. This Thursday, April 28th, uh, we'll be talking about including workers in a dialogue about returning to the office. On Tuesday, May 3rd, we'll be asking, since it's okay to talk about mental health, what should employers be saying and doing? And on Thursday, May 5th, the topic will be making work meaningful in an uncertain world. Uh, so thanks everyone, stay well, bye for now.